Hello, class, and welcome to our discussion of Letitia Elizabeth Landon and the work of hers that we read for class this week called The Marriage Vow. She is another one of our 19th century authors, so lived in the 1800s, of course. If you look at the lecture notes, the written out ones, we have a portrait of Letitia. Um, we also have a couple websites if you'd like more information about her. There's one with biographical and literary information on her and a YouTube clip with a high school girl reciting one of her poems called Revenge, which has very similar themes to Landon's poem that we read for class and the high school students doing this in a poetry college. So it's kind of fun to watch because she does a great job and enlivens the poem, you know, as any competitor would do, right? If you're in a contest, you want to make it as engaging as possible. So that's a fun one to watch. All right, Letitia Elizabeth Landon, better known as L E L as a poem, as a poet. So that's L period E period L period. In other words, her initials, Letitia Elizabeth Landon, L E L. She is British. She lived in England from 1802. She was born in 1802. Um, and she lived there until 1838, um, till 36 years of age. Actually, she didn't live in England till then, but that's how long she lived, period, till only 1838, uh, when she was 36 years old, she tragically died from an overdose of what they think is prussic acid in the British colony um, known as Ghana now, um, and it was over in Africa. So it's a British colony in Africa that we now identify as the country Ghana. She was married to the colony's then governor, George McLean. Now, whether the cause of her death was accident suicide or murder is not fully known though she had been taking prussic acid as medicine for a condition that she had where she experienced spasms a lot so she took the prussic acid to calm the spasms now speculations abound that she may have taken her life you know so purposely overdosed on prussic acid or that she accidentally overdosed on prussic acid or her heart spasms that you know she was taking the medicine the prussic acid for maybe they finally just got the better of her and and, and she died from that or her husband may have murdered her or another theory even a possible jealous african mistress of her husband's may have murdered her so, so many speculations about how she actually died. We don't really know. It's so long ago, and she was in Africa in a place that didn't get a lot of communication. It didn't have a lot of witnesses, so we don't really know the full story, nor were people able to really investigate properly. You know, you know, we didn't have Sherlock Holmes over there. So, um, not, I mean, Sherlock Holmes is fictitious, but I mean, you know, there wasn't like a force that would be able to investigate and even if they were who knows if could, anybody could have determined anything anyway we had there was such you know uh preliminary ideas of how to you know determine um modes of death and things like that back then you know it's just very very primitive compared to what we have nowadays the means right all right well when letitia was only 17 her neighbor william jordan published her verse in the prestigious magazine, the Literary Gazette. Pretty cool. She was only 17 years old and her neighbor published her. He had the ability to, he was a male and he had the ability to publish her because he was the editor of the Literary Gazette. So he must have read her material and thought it was really good, good enough to be published in his literary magazine. So here we have again, another woman having to publish under a pseudonym though. That's where we got L-E-L. -L you know, her initials because of the conventions of the time. So she had to hide her identity that she was a woman. Um, and maybe that was, I don't know, was that the condition under which William Jordan agreed to publish her? I don't know. But anyway, she published under the her initials, L-E-L. -L. Um, the incredible popularity, though, of her recurring verses in the magazine led to the discovery of her being a female because at the time, People wanted to know, you know, if there were, or if someone was just publishing under initials, that was a mystery and people wanted to find out and she was incredibly popular. You can only imagine if somebody was uh, 
publishing under initials nowadays and became incredibly popular. Kind of like, you know, we have Deep Throat, that that um, source for the Nixon Watergate scandal. Everybody wanted to know who was really Deep Throat. And people searched for years and years and investigated for years and years. And then finally, I think the identity was released maybe after Deep Throat actually died or when he was old enough that he didn't think he'd experience um, ramifications or repercussions um, from his disclosing his identity. Anyway, that's just a side note to show you that it still comes, sometimes can even happen and it shows the thirst that people have to want to figure out that identity. So they, they did figure out um, that she was female um, and it seemed to bait the male reader especially when they realized she was young and pretty. So rather than turning people off from her poetry, it got them even more interested. So here we see a an, an very interesting shifting point, right? Where previously that, would, that could really close a lot of doors. Well, here it actually worked to her benefit, you know, and they became even more obsessed with her writing. In fact, she became a best-selling author of her times and made money off the popular gift books that were made of her verses, like the improvisatrice, the improvisatrice in published in 1824. So they would take her poetry and they would print it up in a beautifully bound book and people would give it as, as a gift to somebody to read poetry. Because remember, there was no television, no radio. These, reading poetry was a form of entertainment um, at the time. And, you know, a lively one. People would gather for poetry readings. Um, kind of like we see this poetry contest, right? I told you there's a YouTube video of um, the girl performing her poem. So it was like that, but it was done live uh, for entertainment. And people would read these books on their own too. It was kind of like what we would call maybe like a coffee table book nowadays, right? Where we'd have this beautiful book printed beautifully, laid out on our coffee table for a company to page through. So it was like that. People would give them as gifts and use them for entertainment. So apparently William Jordan, her neighbor, also found Letitia young and pretty. The married neighbor who first published her verses and so facilitated her literary career is rumored to have fathered three children with her. Don't really know, but that's the rumor. Her engagement to John Forster, so she was engaged to a man named John Forster, it was actually cut short because of Letitia's reputation that he discovered as a fallen woman. In other words, that she had fathered three children out of wedlock, potentially with William Jordan. So those rumors pretty much ended her engagement to John Forster. He didn't want to have anything to do with her after that. The themes of Letitia's writings may have also contributed to this reputation. Uh, for example, quote, like a female Byron, remember the romantic poet whose affair with Mary Shelley's stepsister Claire led to an illegitimate daughter? Le she, Letitia, focused mu much of her writing on brooding representations of romantic passion and its vicissitudes. And like her male counterpart, she was considered a bit, at best, rakish, at worst, more terrible for a woman, fallen. Unquote. That's a quote from our anthology about Mary's reputation, or not Mary, sorry, Letitia's reputation at the time. That because she wrote about um, the romantic passion and its, you know, ups and downs and um, turns, and uh, because of that, you know, and that's not typical um, approved t uh, topics for, those aren't typical approved topics of discussion for women at the time, she was considered maybe rakish, but also at the other end of the spectrum, fallen. In other words, you know, it's that whole Eve, you know, the fallen, seducer, temptress, sinner uh, casting of women. Well, published in 1841, after Letitia's untimely death, the poem by Letitia that we read for class uh, is called The Marriage Vow. The poem seems to embody bold ideas on marriage dovetailing with those of other feminists from the time period. Um, as we recall, both Mary Wollstonecraft and her daughter, Mary Wollstonecraft Godwin Shelley, eschewed marriage. Eschewed means, you know, they, they tried to avoid it. 
right? Because they thought that it limited women's rights or women's freedoms, at least. Uh, as did other famous writers from the time period, Margaret Fuller. She is a famous transcendentalist writer that we will be reading later on. Uh, Mary Roth, Anne Askew, Marjorie Kemp. Remember, we read Mary Roth in the Renaissance, as well as Anne Askew. And then we read Marjorie Kemp in the Middle Ages. And the list only continues, right? That, that women um, often felt that marriage would um, subsume them under their husband and they would no longer have their own identity or um, rights. They would have to be, they would have to follow the dictates of their husband. Um, so, so a lot of them didn't want to get married because of that. Um, anyway, uh, you'll see some of those themes in that. And you'll have to, when you're reading it, um, think about that because it's literally called the marriage vow, something that she avoided in her life, right? It was to take the marriage vow. She avoided that. Uh, even Lady Mary Wortley, Wortley Montague's poet epitaph poses an intriguing perhaps counterintuitive perspective on marriage. So we have been tracing this theme throughout these times. Um, so it'll be interesting to see the development that Letitia Landon or L.E.L. makes during the 1800s here. Um, now she did die young. So how did she die? Remember? Um, she eventually did marry, even though she eschewed marriage, she did eventually get married, but she was found with that bottle of prussic acid in her hand, uh, and it was labeled acid hydro, hydrocyanicum delatum, pharmacy London, 1836, medium dose, five minims, being about one third the strength of that in former use, and it was, so she was poison people sometimes that speculate um or perhaps suicide you know i don't know so she did get, get married which is something she we know you know from that she is Jude throughout her life so i don't know if it was an unhappy situation or not for whatever reason she died very at a very young age very untimely at 36 years old with that prussic acid bottle in her hand so Somehow she was poisoned, whether it be by herself, by her husband, by some jealous African mistress, or some jealous mistress, period, um, or it was an accidental overdose. We, we do not know. Don't know if we'll ever know. I hope you can still enjoy, even though you know these circumstances, I hope you can still enjoy her poem, The Marriage Vow, and her life. Enjoy reading about her as a poet, because she's a fascinating woman. All righty. There you go.